The other Grandmaster team or Rajabo managed to do the seemingly impossible and beat Ding Li Ren. That was the first game that the Chinese Grandmaster lost in Siberia after almost a month here. Now the match is tied and today is the last classical game. The other match is also tied and in case there is no result, tomorrow will be a tie break. Yevgeny, what is your prediction? Will we see tie breaks? Will there be two results? Uh, well, we will definitely see the tie break, at least one of the two. That, that's my feeling. And yes, you're right, that perhaps is the most amazing comeback from the whole, from the entire World Cup. Well, while we've seen quite a few of amazing comebacks before, but, well, especially in the final, being very tired, right, paired against the top seed, Ding Li Ren, as, as we said, who barely loses a game, and then Rajabov managed to level the score. So the match is tied going to the last classical game. In the other game as well, it was, well, it's three draws in the match, but last game, Yu Yang Yi, for the first time, had chances, right? He had a big chance. Maxim, at some point, even was mentioned in the interview that he thought he could just simply be lost if... Uh, if his idea to trade rooks would have been prevented. Ah, uh, yeah, right. There was a particular moment where White could have played Queen A3 instead Indeed. of Rook D1, and it was a huge advantage for Yu Yang Yi. Uh, right, so the game has, you can see, started. Maxime, that would be, that would have been my prediction yesterday. If, if we would talk about the openings, I would, would have said it, that Maxime most probably will repeat. He's very principal in the opening. So once again, he goes for this knight c3 line in the Petrov. So Just like he did in game two. Yeah, Yuan Yi tries to be solid. Maxime will try to repeat, find some weak spots in this uh, Petrov line with knight c3. Well, so there is a chance we'll see once again the opposite castles, you know, some excitement. Uh, really depends on what Yu Yang Yi's choice is going to be. In the other game, once again, no surprises on move one. English opening played by Ding Li Ren, and Rajabov goes for, well, a very interesting, uh, quite a popular line, which was introduced by, uh, to, to the high-level high practice by Alexander Krishuk. The line was bishop c5, so particularly playing uh, the... Sicilian dragon with colors reversed, being a tempo down, he's still trying to claim that this position is fine. So bishop to c5, uh, but we won't see uh, we won't see the knight on b6. If you remember the game between Grishuk and mm -hmm. Ding Li Ren, where Grishuk ended up having somewhat strange set of uh, setup of his positions. Like the knight was on b6, and then the bishop went to c5. So this time Rajabov's knight remains on d5, as you can see from a camera view. So bishop c5, and after castle short, black typically goes for bishop b6. Since you mentioned that game, we could compare it. Uh, that was a game that Ding Liren played here in Hunting Messi against Alexander Grishuk, and with that victory, he won the match against the Russian Grandmaster. The opening there was um, this bishop c5 line, as you can imagine, but the move order was so different that yeah. uh, Ding Liren played g3 on the second move, delaying knight f3. So, yeah, so the trick was that at some point white uh, uh, applies the pressure on, on the knight on d5, and black kind of has to move, has to move the knight from d5. So we'll show this as soon as we'll have the the analysis board on. And in the other game, which yellow graph against Yu Yang Yi, uh, as I said, a lot will depend on a chance uh, on a choice of Yu Yang Yi. So uh, the Chinese grandmaster decided to go for a different setup with knight developed on c6, bishop on f5. So that's an attempt to play it with castle long for black. That's some. Um, uh, yet another playable system. I, I'm not really sure what's, you know, what's wrong about it. Possibly nothing's wrong. <laughs> it's just that uh, the setup with Castle Short, which was chosen by Caruana and you know, Wesley Saw and such, uh, it tends to be a bit more popular. So in a way, with opposite castles, black sometimes is looking for more than, more than equality. And like in this World Cup, we had a game between uh, Nakamura and uh, Livedito Nisipiano in round two, if I'm not mistaken, where Nisipiano opted for a castle short, opposite castles, even though his opponent, Higaro Nakamura, had to win. It was game two of the match. 
And at some point, black was completely winning, so Nispiano made the draw because it, well, it would just you know, decide the match in his favor, but his position was completely winning. So in our game now, for Yu Yang Yi and Maxime Bushiello-Graf, we have a very solid approach from black, so trying to be solid at first, but not very likely black will get any chances to play for a win. As soon as we have the analysis board, we will show you guys the game between Ding Liren and Alexander Grishuk that had this similar idea, bishop c5, but different move order, so that was g3 on the second move by so the c4, Chinese grandmaster. So c4, knight to f6 still, yeah? Uh, or, yeah. or e5. c4, e5, g3. Yeah, well, so it was quite a different thing, but yeah, well, essentially bishop g2, uh, and he has played d5 here, right? Uh, bishop c5 uh, first. Bishop c5 first, d2, d3, and then d5. Yes. So takes, knight captures on d5, knight c3, and that's the problem, because, say, knight c6, knight f3, castles, castles, would transpose to our game, but black can't play knight c6, really, because his knight on d5 is hanging. Therefore, Grushuk went for knight b6, knight f3, knight c6, castles, I believe, right? Castle, castle, a3, a5. A3, A5, and this one is somewhat awkward. Having the knight on B6, bishop on C5 mm -hmm. is somewhat awkward for black. So knight A4, I believe. That knight was. A4, knight takes, queen takes, knight D4. So the knights got swapped. Uh, yeah, knight takes, I believe bishop takes, right? And bishop mm -hmm. D2, that was, that was, yes, the, that was the tricky move. that was the Dingler and Grishuk game. And Dingler and outplayed uh, Alexander Grishuk in that game and made it to the next stage of the World Cup. Now today is a different story, we got, we're going to compare yeah. this variation. So four knights g3, which allows black to play, which would seem the most popular setup nowadays. Basically a Rosalima variation with, once again, with colors reversed with an extra tempo. Go for bishop b4 and then very often black would take on c3. But Rajabov says no, I want to play it in a Sicilian fashion, once again with colors reversed. Bishop g2 and bishop to c5. And then Ding Liren starts to think right now, which is a bit surprising. As far as I remember, the line goes castles, bishop to... I know, you're supposed to castle as well with black, right? And then this is a kind of a critical moment because you can play d3, you can play... How was it? I mean, it was, it was a lot of games like that. It's like yes, it's so some of the most uh, recent and highest rated games in this line were between Magnus Carlsen and Fabiano Caruana at the World Championship match. I see two games for this exact same moment and both were drawn as most games had the World Championship match, no news there. I wonder for how long they will be repeating either the Carson Corona game or this year, Magnus also had this line against Anish Giri in uh, that's April. The game. Ah, yeah, that's the game Magnus won in Geshem of Memorial. That was, that was a great game, in fact. Yeah. So if we can go through this mm -hmm. one really quickly. Against Anish, that was... So the moment after Bishop C5, Castle, Castle, D3 h6, knight takes d5, queen takes d5, a3, a5, bishop to d2, queen e6. So in a way, it gets quite similar with Krishuk against Ding Liren, or, or Ding Liren against Krishuk yeah. game, because later on, black went for knight d4, right? So rook what was like Rook to c1. Queen e7. Queen e7 first, yeah. Bishop c3 and knight d4. Knight d4, e3, knight takes, queen takes. I believe that was, yeah. that was uh, the game. This game where we have the four bishops. We don't see this as often as knight and bishop or two knights. I think when both players are having a pair of bishops, it's a different kind of middle game. Won by Magnus Carlsen at the Gashima Memorial this year against Anish Giri. I'm curious for how long today's game between Ding Liren and Timur Rajabo will repeat any of these lines and who will deviate? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's a great question. I believe black doesn't have all that many options to deviate from that if white castles goes d3 Ah, oh, no, h6. h6 is actually not, not forced, yeah. 
So Castles Castles, D3, H6 is, uh, well, a possible but not a necessary move. So uh, so Dingler, <laughs> sorry that I interrupted you, I was just surprised e5. that he does deviate by taking on E5. It's a temporary, uh, well, temporary, temporary sacrifice. sacrifice. We can show the idea. So if the knight behind. takes, it's very obvious to yeah. <laughs> just knight D5, yeah. And if knight takes C3 played, then white typically recaptures on c3, knight e5, and white goes d4. You know what's fascinating about this move is that even though the, the line without knight takes e5, that's been played so many times, we mentioned Magnus Carlsen and so many other strong players, so that's a very popular line, there are many games for that position in the database. Knight takes e5 was almost never tried ever in chess history, and if it was played, the highest rated player who made this move was at 2100 with the white pieces against an unrated opponent in 1999. And the player with white has actually lost this game. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Great reference. Yeah, so knight takes e5. Yeah, well, Rajabov is surprised, of course, not that he doesn't know the next move, but, but yeah. it, is, it is a bit of a shocker, to be honest, yeah? Well, from what we can uh, read, uh, according to our database, if there are basically no games for this position by anyone yeah. who is a titled player, it usually means that it's not considered to be a good variation. Absolutely. So what I'm thinking that it could be, if, if you really get this position, and I'm honestly a bit curious about bishop takes c6. There is knight c6 as well. But then you might be, I oh know, knight c6, wait a sec, knight c6, queen f6 resigns. Yeah, that, that's not a good idea, <laughs> perhaps, because f2 is targeted as well as the queen. So knight c6 is not an option. Bishop c6 with a check, pawn takes, and then take on c3 might be playable, but black supposed to get fantastic initiative over there. It's like going queen d5. Knight back to f3, bishop h3, the king remains in the center. I don't really believe in, in white's position in this case. So yeah, so it looks like white's going to capture with the b pawn. Knight takes e5, d4. After bishop d6, white captures there, trades the queens. So white will be somewhat better developed for this. Black has more compact pawn structure. Well, fairly simplified game. Very likely a draw. So it could be that Ding's, uh, Ding Liren's decision is just to drag it to a tie break. Well, sorry to say that. Sorry to ruin the magic on move seven, but it's very likely that now. Sorry. Wait. Bishop takes his six. <laughs> Wait. So he is serious about playing this position. Okay. He Knight may takes. have a brilliant idea here. Yeah, that, that's what I said. That's very dangerous. That supposedly he takes a lot of risk by doing this. But he is, yeah, he's winning the pawn. He's trying to win the pawn. So B takes C3 and black supposedly has fantastic compensation for this pawn. But we have the game. There won't be a quick draw. No, I was wrong. There won't be. won't be a quick draw, and this must be a variation that Rajabov absolutely did not expect. No one ever tried it at higher levels, not even anyone at Open Tournaments, yeah. title players, no one. There are no games for this Knight takes E5. It must mean that it's not the best move according to the engine, and therefore Rajabov wouldn't analyze this at all, meaning that Ding Liren has now the, the preparation on his side. Yesterday yeah. he felt out prepared. Today he out prepares the job by choosing something that seems to be dubious. But maybe at depth 45, uh, this position is great for white. Who knows? Yeah, absolutely. It, it could be one of those lines where objectively white is fine. He takes risks, right? It's white who has to be more precise, let's say, but. At the end of the analysis, it will be in equal position. But if Black misplays it, and, and now we know that Ding Li Ren apparently has analyzed it, while Rajabov has not. If Black misplays it, it's, it's an extra pawn for White. So, well, that's one of the legit ways to try to play for a win. This, of course, we're still yet to see whether Rajabov will react uh, correctly or not. But uh, so far, I think it's a very good practical choice for Ding Li Ren and a good attempt to claim the title today. Yeah, so that's, that. and, and of course, uh, extra points for, you know, extra credit for being brave and not 
uh, well, that's a really, I, I was a bit uh, scared that, well, this game will peter out pretty quickly and sometimes people would do it, especially after a defeat. So you kind of don't want to gamble in your last remaining classical game. You want to say, oh, well, let's, let's play the tiebreak because it kind of less pressure on you in a way. So because chess players, they do have perception of those rapid and blitz games as the, a bit of a lottery. And, you know, after playing for one month, you might as well say, Oh well, let's let's just go to play the tiebreak. But, but now, not the English, now, and not I'm the so happy to see this approach. Actually, both players in this final surprised us with their fighting spirit and bravery, even in moments when it seemed it was a bit too much. For instance, Tim Rajabov said after game two, the game that he lost, that he simply didn't want a boring position for that yeah. day. Even though he had the black pieces, he went for a sharp, complex position, and it just really goes to show how these two players are. Amazing with their attitude here. They have spent almost a month in Siberia. Exhaustion, uh, all the tension of the event. They are playing here for the title. And yet, they keep coming back wanting to win and not, not playing it safe, basically. Yeah. So I'm really curious to see how this develops. Because, as I said, well, this looks like a very tempting continuation. So queen to d5, forcing the knight back to f3, and then going bishop h3, not letting white to castle short easily. Might be wrong, might be bishop h3 immediately, might be as well that black simply castles short, allowing white to do the same, but then still claiming compensation because of the powerful light square bishop. But of course, the pressure is on Rajabov's side now, because <laughs> yes, he understands, he... Well, basically, you, you do not feel like you're sacrificing a pawn with bishop c5 if you're not aware of this line, mm -hmm. right? And also, in this situation, psychology comes into play again, that you know that you are playing a position that your opponent has prepared with the engine and his team, and you are there, sitting in front of the world number three with the black pieces, having to find the best moves all by yourself. So that is basically the situation that Tim Rajabov is facing. Yeah, and that'd be, of course, I don't know what the result's going to be, but it'll be amazing if, say, game two, Ding Liren has sacrificed the pawn and has won against Rajabov. And now he's trying to do something right the opposite, so taking strategic risk, giving his opponent two bishops advantage and initiative, but grabbing the pawn. I see we are being informed on Twitch that there is a high-level correspondence game for this position. That wouldn't surprise me, actually, that it yeah. has been tested in correspondence chess. Unfortunately, I don't have access to correspondence games in my database here. At home, I would. <laughs> but uh, that's great to know that there is one high-level game in correspondence chess for this line. Obviously, it was not a novelty. We did see other games for this move, but it has never been tested in a classical game. Yeah, I believe bishop c6 was never played, right? Knight e5, I mean, if, if, if we check it. Yeah, let me see those few games. So there were a few games in classical chess for this, but no one titled player, not a single, um, not a single high-level tournament. So knight takes c5, knight takes c3, and bishop takes c6. There was still one uh, game. Still this one game which was won by black. Yes, that's the one game I highlighted that it's a 2100 with the white pieces against an unrated opponent in 1999. And that went the same way with bishop c6 and then b takes c3. Yeah, and perhaps a few words about what we mean when we say correspondence chess, right? Because that's oh, a sure. good old tradition of, it. you know, <laughs> having a couple of days per move time control and then hmm. analyzing with your chess set at home, right? Sometimes asking for a help of a friend to, well, that was, I, I did participate in, in one of those tournaments and, uh, well, that's perhaps the only tournament I had to quit not finishing it after hmm. one and a half hours of playing. Uh, sorry, one and a half years of playing, obviously. Yes. <laughs> so that was, that was terrifying back then. One but and now, a half of years. course, with the modern technology, they play, they also call it the email chess, right? Because obviously you, you do not use the snail mail to send uh, the postcards <laughs> with the next move. Yeah, you use an email. And, uh, the romantic era of sending yeah. a postcard with your next move. 
And yeah, and sometimes to speed up the process, you, you would go like E4, and if you reply with E5, my next move is Knight F3, Three and I offer, <laughs> yeah, I offer you a search variation, yeah, like, like E4, and then you, if you reply E5, my move will be Knight F3. If you reply with Knight C6, I'm going Bishop B5. So you save some, you know, some money on, <laughs> you some money and, and the time, yeah, and the time as well. Right, oh, but nowadays, the, the, you know, the curse of the correspondence chess is, of course, the possibility to analyze with engines. It's a curse in a way, but at the same time, since they allowed to use the computers, that turned into a really a scientific process, because you understand, you analyze the position with computer, your opponent does the same. So you basically have, and, and those correspondence guys, once again, I have to say, they have powerful machines as well. So you basically know that if there is any kind of tactic, you will find it, that means your opponent's going to find it. So there, there won't be any stupid blunders. And what you're looking for, for some positions where engine evaluation might be misleading. So mm -hmm. it's still the one who plays better chess typically wins or understands how the machine analysis works. So those guys, they are more of a, you know, more of a... A science person, mm -hmm. yeah, sci scientists uh, than the actual sportsmen, which makes it very interesting and it makes the their games, like their an, uh, opening analysis, very of a very very high quality. So typically, if you say I'm following the game from a correspondence database, that means you know like a quality sign. So that's. That's a good idea if it was played by correspondence guys. Yeah, shout out to all of you here on Twitch and YouTube for coming up with that additional information that uh, I was not aware of. Thank you so much. It's always great to have you guys here. Let us know about your thoughts on this very last classical game. Will we see tie breaks tomorrow? This is now oof, heating up or not heating up. Let's see. Dingler has just played queen b3. So bishop goes to g4, queen to b3. Uh, well, there is an option for this to, you know, to actually get simply fight quite a bit. Uh, Black is no way forced to trade the queens, but he might with this move, Bishop G2, where White has to take on D5 immediately, has to go Rook G1, simply no other options. Bishop F3, E F3, and here I'm really not sure if White's doubled extra pawn is good enough to claim anything real. So if this works for black, that might be once again um, the way that this game is getting simplified. Now it's of course on Rajabov because, uh, well, he might want to keep the queens. That, that's what I would be looking for. Mm -hmm. Keep the queens on the board to try to attack the king, which is for quite a long time is getting stuck in the center. So a move like queen h5 or queen e4. Particularly, I'm looking at queen e4 allows d3 with the tempo, though. So, so let's say we are playing queen h5, planning to castle short, put both rooks in the center, and then yeah, it's it's still White who has to prove who has to prove uh, that he's well, his king is safe. So I'm going queen h5 perhaps, but yeah, as I've mentioned, there is this side option of playing bishop g2, bishop f3, uh, while well, trying to make a draw. Well, with with good Good probability, I'd say, uh, in a position pawn down, but White's extra pawn will be doubled and of no significant impact. Uh, right, and we can switch to the other game. Let's not forget we have a playoff for the third place going on between Maxime Vashielograf and Yu Yang Yi. So that's a second white game for Maxime Vashielograf. So we'll switch the camera view accordingly in a few seconds. And this is for the third place, which we keep highlighting that could be a potential wild card for the candidates. It's not guaranteed, but the third place here, the third place at the Grand Prix, and the second place at the Grand Swiss will be taken into account for the wild card for the 2020 candidates tournament. Yeah, well, I found, I don't quite remember, perhaps it was somewhere on, on Facebook, that, uh, which I find to be a very decent idea. So why don't those guys place three from here, place three from the Grand Prix, place two from uh, the Grand Suisse, and those who are very close by rating, why don't they have an extra 
little tournament. qualification tournament. Right? I think you're referring to the tweet of uh, Magnus Carlsen's second Grandmaster uh, Peter Heine and Nielsen. I'm going to bring that up actually because well, that was an could interesting be. thought. Could be. I, don't, I, don't, I don't remember exactly I mean, wh wh where it comes from but it does make a lot of sense in my opinion. It does, and that would be a great improvement. Of it. So we could have an additional tournament for all the players who miss out on the qualification. So the third place here, the third place at the Grand Prix, and second place at the Grand Swiss. That could be an idea for future events. Uh, right, so, but yeah, well, they look for the best format, I believe, and, and then sooner or later they, they'll... Well, there is a chance they'll come up with this. Indeed. Now, in terms of the opening here, we are seeing a repetition of Game 2, where right. Maxime went for the nice C3 variation of the Petra of Defense. So, Bishop E7, Bishop to E3, and now the first separate move is, uh, as I've highlighted, I believe, during the second game. So, you have uh, White inevitably goes for Queen D2 in Castle Long. That's what he does. Uh, while Black has two different setups. Go Knight C6, develop the Light Square Bishop, and I'm not specifying because both bishop e6 and bishop f5 exist, and play queen d7, go for the long castle. Try to defend, well, somewhat unpleasant but perfectly playable position. And for this line, you can check, for instance, Karviakin Karwana from the last candidates 2018 that was, right? Mm -hmm. um, or you can do what Yu Yang Yi did in the previous game, go for castle short and play the position with opposite castles. And even though opposite castles typically imply that there will be a lot of sharpness in the position, yeah, but not necessarily, and Yu Yang Yi made a comfortable draw in game two. This time, however, he says, no, there won't be any opposite castles. He goes knight c6, queen d2, and as I said, bishop e6 used to be played, but... Yuyang Yi goes for bishop f5. Castle short, queen to d7, bishop c4, bishop f6, knight goes to d4. According to my database, knight d4 is a novelty. Even bishop f6 was barely ever played. So after bishop c4, there are still a very few games with bishop f6 only happen in one of them. None of them were played at grandmaster level. So once again, we are looking at really old games at open tournaments between club players that really uh, is not uh, the main theory normally. Absolutely. Uh, right, so the point of knight d4, yeah, the obvious idea of course to grab one of the bishops to get, uh, well, a pair of bishops advantage. Uh, black very likely to take on d4 of course. Now the big question is, does white take with the pawn? I believe the answer is no. Uh, well, white can take with the pawn and then allow the absolutely symmetrical position after d5. So d5, chase the bishop from c4, then castle long or short in this case, with such a symmetrical structure, there won't be that much of a sharpness, right? Uh, so I suspect white takes on d4 with the bishop, and then if bishop takes, queen takes. Black finds it awkward to keep the king in the center, and cannot castle long because a seven pawn is hanging. So black is forced into a short castle, which makes the position much more sharp. Just, mm -hmm. um, sorry I interrupted you there. Yeah. I was just looking at the database at the same time, and I wanted to highlight that we are in unknown territory also for the reason that Maxim played bishop c4 on move 10. There were still games for that position with, for instance, king to b1. That seems to be the main move there, played in games such as Peter Leko versus Vasily Ivanchuk in 2015. Yeah, I believe you postponed the development of f1. Bishop king b1 is typically a useful move uh, in order, after castle long, to go for bishop f1 to b5 to pin the knight and then threaten knight d4. So yeah, the Leko of Ivanchuk game uh, followed with King B1, castle King side, and H4 immediately. Peter Leko is not famous for being an aggressive attacker, but in this game he went for the King of Ivanchuk and he won. He so won King B1, once again, how was it? King B1, castle short, right? A castle short, H4, H4. Rook A E8, Bishop E2, Bishop to D8, and H5. Yeah. Leko went for the kingside attack and won the game before they reached the time control. All right, so what happens in our game? After bishop f6, everything is getting swapped on d4 after Maxime's knight d4 move. 
castles short and rook h to e1. So once again, well, fairly simplified position. White is still some better, better developed, better coordinated in a way. But again, it, in this position, it's not that much sharpness left. So black has to be careful not to drop the a7 pawn, but I don't see a problem with going rook f to e8, to be honest. Now, so this was the preparation of Maxim going for bishop c4 on move 10 and then knight d4, because it does seem that he came to today's game having this variation in mind. Do you, do you think that he actually believes in some slight chance to get something out of this middle game here, even though it doesn't look very dangerous for black? Yeah, that's perhaps what he's looking at. It's like, I'll try it. That's one, once again the safety belt approach, right? Hmm. So, so I'll, <laughs> I'll try to press, but I'll never get the chance to lose in this position, which... Uh, more or less being motto for their match hmm. uh, for in, in all the other games. Any updates in the uh, thing Rajab of Yeah, game? yeah. Timur actually has played bishop h3 to g2. So hmm. it will be more of a, I'm trying to prove I have enough compensation in the end game approach. Let's show it one more time. Yeah, so bishop g2, here. rook g1 is not a move because black just takes on f3 and in this moment, guards the queen on d5. Yeah? And when you take queen f3, it's just bad for white. So therefore, after bishop g2, you capture on d5 first, then you play rook g1. And unless black can play bishop h3, which I don't see the reason why he would do so. Yeah, no, not really. Bishop h3, just d3, bishop e3, white is the pawn up. Yeah, so after that, Exchange in rook g1. Black captures on f3. So it is an extra pawn for white. But perhaps black has enough resources to equalize. Could be with d5, d4 immediately. Just like not letting white play d4 himself. Because, say, after castles, d4 attack, for instance, bishop e3. It'll be tough to win for white, but it is an extra pawn, right? It mm -hmm. is an extra pawn. So uh, typically what white wants is to keep one, one of the rooks on the board, so trade one pair of rooks, keep the other, and then start moving your kingside pawns in order to undouble to make your extra pawn real. And if not, then black will have to give up some space on the king side. So well, that, that'd be some chances for, for white, but... But this is not a bad practical situation for Ding Liren for what you mentioned in the other match too. That you have the draw in your pocket. Right. But you can play for a win forever without any risk because you're a pawn up yet yeah, doubled pawns, but you're the only one who can win this game. Yeah, right. But, but I don't believe Rajabov has to try d5, d4 immediately. So not uh, giving white an easy hand developing here. Because say... If white captures, then bishop d4 with the tempo, rook b1, and then, let me check if I know the castle rights. Yes, king <laughs> is not crossing the attacked square, right? Only the rook. It's only confusing the rook. for some people, yeah, but, but king can castle like that. So castle's long, the other rook comes to e1. Black is really well mobilized and should have little problem equalizing, right? So, so simply black's pieces are too active. So after d4, I don't actually think white is in a position to capture on d4. Has to do something else. Well, so far, a bit surprising thing that Ding Liren actually didn't play a move. It what is surprising are the, what because... What are the alternatives? Uh, <laughs> yeah, his, his options are very limited to start with. And secondly, he must have analyzed this. It's not possible that he didn't look at this yeah. alternative for black. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's so straightforward. He played queen b3 quickly, so why don't you look at bishop g2, right? I would think that he's already <laughs> discussing in his head the move that's going to be in four, five, six moves from here on and not what's happening right now. Otherwise, yeah, I don't understand the absolutely, time spent. Yeah. It's like you are thinking, how maybe it's not about the move, but probably, or whatever. It's like, how realistic my chances are in this end game? Yes, Even though this, uh, this end game mm -hmm. is unavoidable, basically, but, mm -hmm. but still, it, uh, it's some kind of an inner dialogue.
Yes, some of you are saying whether Ding may be annoyed by this liquidating line. Uh, that's a good point too, if, if he thinks that, oh, my opponent found the, the most draw likely variation. But even like that, uh, it's still a pawn up for white and yeah, it's absolutely. an endgame he can try to win. And the other thing is, it's not like it was uh, hard to find, right? I mean, yeah. that, that's one of the straightforward moves you're, you're actually looking at. It can be a bit similar to the variations that Rajabov tried with the white pieces, that oftentimes you know that there is a forced way for your opponent to equalize. Or basically just make a but draw. She can't. Yeah. <laughs> but he has to find it. In game one, Dingleren did find it. In uh, game, game three, three, he didn't. So sometimes yeah. they make a draw out of the opening because you surprise your opponent with an opening novelty, but if he finds the most precise way to continue, it's still a draw. And what happened yesterday was similar. Rajabov was aware of the possibility of a forcing line. It could lead to a draw, but since Dingliren didn't find it, the game went on and Rajabov could play for a win. We're going to see if it's similar today with this bishop g2 line. Yeah, never. <laughs> but look, yeah, that, that's some, some debate with himself the, the English brand is involved in. Because, honestly, there is a... Well, is c3, c4 ever a move? That, that's the only thing I can think of. It's, it's C4. incredibly dangerous. Yeah, but I'm, I'm just trying to, to look at, you know, at, at this position and <laughs> find an alternative. It's, it's not like I, I'm considering C4 being a good move, but, but just a move that, that doesn't lead to the same position. No, it probably is terrible. To know why probably is thinking? terrible. Hmm. What do you guys think? Will, will we see some kind of an aggression here? C4, is there any alternative to the line that you have going to show? No, no, not really. No, I think is it. He I mean, the chat. It, <laughs> is he satisfied or not? He has to take. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would still like to know the opinion here on yeah, Twitch well, and YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> People yeah, suggest that you don't. <laughs> don't don't tell us anything. No, of course, of course, tell us. I mean, how do you see the position of the C3, C4? Cause yeah, that's that's another that's question. It looks like one of the one of the. Perhaps the only alternative, if I'm honest. Yeah, rook g1 is, is just terrible. So it's either trade the queens or try to play c4 with the tempo, which, by the way, guards the f3 knight, and then play rook g1. Could be that it's playable, in fact. Huh. I'm curious to see whether we're going to see that end game or an alternative like c4. And if so, why is Ding thinking? Because if you have prepared C4, you, yes. you would make that move after a minute or two, I would Absolutely. assume. Absolutely. Or Queen D5. Yeah, well, well, particularly after Queen B3, which he played pretty quickly, you do expect him to know what's the answer after the most direct approach from black. Well, then the situation could also be, of course, these are all assumptions, but based on the fact that he's thinking, it's also possible that he's aware, obviously, of that end game, and he's aware of an alternative. Maybe he knows that one of them is better than the other. He's evaluating where does he have better practical chances, because the engine evaluation is not everything. Yeah, well, it's like, you know, I believe this is what engine would claim to be the best continuation. The other one, the, the move like C4, is of course connected with great risk. Uh -huh. And then perhaps he is evaluating, should I take this risk? I mean, how much of a risk I'm running? Because after C4, keeping the queens on the board, well, I don't see anything straightforward for black. But believe me, this position is dangerous for white, right? So white might be having like a better chance to win compared to the end game, but at the same time, this is the position where he runs risk of losing, while after queen d5, he's just 100% safe. That could be the reason why he's thinking. That Speaking of 100% safe, isn't this position, uh, the position between Yu Yang Yi and Maxim Vashielograph, is just 100% safe for both? <laughs> <laughs> b7, b6, and I was looking at this, but now I realize, yeah, why not? B6, make it uh, as comfortable for yourself as you can. B6, A5, bring the rook to E8, trade the rooks. We had, uh, we've seen it in game two. So E mm -hmm. file is there to trade the rooks on. And then agree a draw. 
Do you think you will see a handshake soon in this game and nothing exciting? Yeah, I don't, I don't really see how you make it exciting over there. It's like... We have a move by Dengeron and that is not c4, but uh, queen, takes queen takes d5. Queen takes d5, yeah. That's queen takes d5 played in Ding Liran's game. No surprises here. The only surprise being him spending around 10 minutes in this position. So I can guess the next move for Timur Rajab now. <laughs> Uh, that's one thing that I will be really curious to hear in the post-mortem analysis, regardless of the result of this game. What he was thinking in this moment, yeah, yeah. what was... Could it be that he was preparing for the tiebreak mentally? <laughs> you <laughs> know, he was, that's not the case. He was thinking, like, uh, what should I play in the tiebreak game too? <laughs> I'm gonna write that moment down for myself, in case I forget. I've got like five sheets here with all sorts of notes, but uh, it's difficult to keep track of everything. Yeah. Move tw 12, queen takes d5. Yeah, but, you know, that, there's been examples in the chess history when one grandmaster in an absolutely drawish position, say he's offered a draw by his opponent and he would think for half an hour. And the position is like that draw, rook end game, three pawns edge. And the guy's thinking for half an hour before accepting a draw and then being asked, tell me, what, what, what was that about? And I was thinking, because I'm in a must-win situation tomorrow, so I was thinking, what opening I have to play tomorrow in order to get winning chances with black? So sometimes that would be, yeah, well, that, that those chess players, you know. Yeah, we're going to see if we get an answer by Ding Liren to what were his thoughts in that moment. And this game still goes on. An end game with an extra pawn for white. Some practical chances. Yeah, right. So we've reached this moment after bishop f3 and g f3. So, well, the key now is if black does or doesn't play d5, d4. d4 being more direct approach. And honestly, I don't see what's wrong with this d4 move, but who knows, maybe Rajabov will uh, conclude that it's, it's fine just to castle, let's say, castle longer, or, or go king d7, perhaps. So, both games are in a similar situation in the sense that they are not the most aggressive, dynamic, uh, attacking chess positions, but there is a chance that here Ding Liren will play for a long time trying to get something out of this extra pawn. It's a risk-free position where if he wins, he claims the title. So I think this is going to be yeah. a long game. Well, actually, that's a comfortable situation for Ding Liren. Very comfortable. Yeah, you right. can torture your opponent forever. So this is going to be a long game today, but the other one, the other one... Mm, could be if Maxim will demonstrate what's the uh, what's the idea behind this setup for which by the way he went pretty quickly. I don't see it, but who knows? Maybe, maybe he has some. It's like a move before. I would actually con consider going g2 g4. Point being that after bishop g4, white seemingly has rook g1, and I don't know if he's winning here, but apparently he does. Yeah. So g7 being attacked, and then f2, f3. Mm -hmm. Looks like white is winning. Well, at least it would be terribly dangerous to capture the pawn. But perhaps in this case, black would have bishop to e6. So after rook to e1, b6, can this be the moment white plays g4? Maybe that's the point. Because now, same thing, bishop g4, rook g1 looks terribly awkward because of the pain on the G file. And bishop e6 is not similar because having the rook on e1, white can actually take on e6 and black is forced to capture with the pawn. And I don't really know how this, uh, what's the evaluation of such position is, but I can see it being somewhat better for white. It certainly looks more comfortable for the fact that white's pieces are really active and there's this e6 weakness. Yeah, well, but... But, uh, but also f4 will be hanging. f4, yeah. It's like, at th first I thought, yeah, we'll pressure on e6 for, well, for some time and then we'll see if it works or not. But for this, you have to have the pawn on g3. Yeah. And having the pawn on... Yeah, so, so that, well, that that your f4... That would be a free hand, that yeah, that, that's, that's like really a free roll. I mean, you try for as long as you can, as you like, and your opponent is bound to be on defensive. But... If you have a pawn on g3, we are in no power to force black to play bishop e6. So that's, that's the, that's makes it problematic. And 
Other than that, yes, Black is now ready to play rookie 8, AE8, FE8, whatever, just trade the rooks, make a draw. Not that many witnesses in Black's camp. I mean, that's why I wanted to play like G4, F4, trying to either to go for a kingside attack or provoke Black to play bishop E6 to create some weakness. Because Black's position, yes, a bit passive, but very, very solid. We shall see whether Maxim has any intentions of expanding on the king side or has another way to continue. He, I think he must have an idea, or am I just being too optimistic here? He went for this variation on purpose, bishop c4 as well on move 10, instead of repeating the Leko Ivanchuk and the rest of the games in the database. So it seemed he wants to improve on those games with bishop c4, or it's not that much of an attempt to improve. Yeah, and, uh, well, if truth being told, the Petrov is very annoying opening, because for, say, there are many other annoying openings after e4, e5, like the Berlin defense, the Marshall that we've seen, but luckily for White, he has choices on move three, like in case of knight c6, you don't want to uh, don't want to play the Ruy Lopez, you can play bishop c4, right? You can go bishop b5, but then after the Berlin defense, you can opt for d3 always. Uh, there is still a game. You don't have such luxury in Petrov. If you don't want to enter the Petrov defense, the only spare option you have is to play bishop f1 to c4, uh -huh. so called bishop's opening, which, by the way, was played in one of our award-seeking games of the tournament. Yeah, let's, let's bring it up again. That is so true. There is a contest for the, the voting on internet going on, or, or actually, it, it is finished. Is so, it? So, yeah, so, so the pool is finished. Now it's up to jury to pick up the game from the finals. Mm -hmm. And I've been told, uh, well, I'll have to double-check it mm, for the th third candidate game for rounds five and six is Rajabo's victory over Maxim Bushielogrov. Oh, that's, so we that's have, actually a good choice. Yeah, so we have for round one and two, it was Alir Zafiruj against Daniel Dubov. For rounds three and four, it was Jeffrey Chong with this mm, bishop's opening against uh, Jan Krzysztof Duda, the return game where Jeffrey had to win in order to stay in the match. And then for rounds five and six, it was Ranjab of MVL, the game that decided one of the semifinals. So what would be your pick for the finals so far? One of those decisive games, that's obvious, right? But I think I would pick the game where Dingley ran one. Yeah, well, well I have the same feelings, because really it was alpha zero-ish type of it was a king side attack, game. and then a really a a very nice, well, spectacular in a way finish, right? So, well, to understand that in this position with equal material, the knight will be so much dominated by the bishop, so that the bishop yeah. on d5 will completely restrict black's knight. So once again, we are referring to the game from round two, from mm -hmm. game two from the final, where Dean Glee ran one against Timur Rajab. Yeah, not that uh, yesterday's game by Timur Rajab wasn't any good, but uh, I think in terms of brilliancy, because this is about the beauty prize uh, for the best game of the World Cup, the victory of Dingley Ram was more impressive. Also for the fact that Rajabov decided to go for a not boring position. So it's thanks to Rajabov too that he didn't want to play a more solid end game. Yeah, so in a way we can say that it was, well... Uh, contribution the by the Contribution by, yeah, Timur Rajab. So after b6, Maxim plays bishop to d5. Which might make it awkward for black now that I'm looking at it. Uh, rook's attacked, and in case of the most natural rook e8, so the, I was advocating this, this idea of trading all the rooks, I believe queen to c4 is an idea. And bishop c6 being a threat, rook e1, rook e1, rook e8. No bishop c6 because of a check on e1, but that would be a terrible oversight because of bishop f7 check. And then when queen takes on f7, that's the moment where the queen is pinned, and it's a checkmate on e8, taking the rook. So, while after bishop d5, you very likely do play rook e8, the alternative being c7, c6, but then 
This is a real position. I mean, that, that one is actually quite playable. It's no longer that solid for black. Black has to start overextending again by going uh, d5, which allows c4, or has to try to defend the pawn on d6, but w once again it makes the pieces, his pieces passive. White once again probably plays c3, c4, so that, that's no longer that equal. I'd say it's still a playable position perhaps, but white clearly is the one who is trying. So if you want to make it, oh, sorry, to keep it solid, you probably go rook a1, but then you better know what to do after queen c4. And then this could be the idea of the Frenchman, even if he has spent already 17 minutes to reach this position, he must have had something in his preparation when he decided to go for bishop c4. So yeah, we are seeing this position. Yeah, rook e8 and queen c4 played, yeah. So that at least seems like a legit way to put some pressure on, black's, on black. And that's just great to see <laughs> when there's fight on the board and they are not going for a short game and say, we're going to decide it tomorrow in the rapid. Mm. Maxime escaped from a really dangerous situation yesterday. He could have been lost at some point of the game in his uh, yesterday's game against Yu Yangi. He was, of course, really relieved after the game that Yu Yangi allowed the trade of rooks and then even went for the trade of queens and offered a draw in a position where we thought that white could have still continued and uh, there was a lot of pressure on the Frenchman. So coming back from the, the dead, I think now Maxime should feel really good about his chances. Uh, yeah, but we, we will never know if his intention is not to, well, I mean, they typically don't say it during interviews, but it could be that his intention was like, well, try a little, but if not, tiebreak is still fine. For those two, as we've already discussed, it's not that easy to tell who will be a favorite on a tiebreak, mm -hmm. right? Because Yu Yang Yi proved that he can play very well under shorter time controls. He played most of the tiebreaks here among the four players in the finals. Yu Yang Yi played almost every single match of his in tiebreaks, except for two. One of them included his match against Yan Yi Pom Yoshi. Only one. That only was one? the, that only was the only, oh, that that was was the only match that he has won oh. in classical chess. It was the match against Jan Nepomuk. He has started by playing a tiebreak in round one. Oh, you're that, right. Uh, that's Even that's round the one. Ex exception, yeah. yeah. All the rest, they won their round one without a tiebreak. The least number of tiebreaks was played by Timur Rajabov. So we could claim that uh, out of the four players here, it's Yu Yang Yi who has the most experience, at least in terms of his matches here in Siberia. But that also means that he could be more exhausted than the rest of the players. But yeah. here is how he made it to he the finals. Well, not finals, indeed, in this case, semi-finals for semi -finals, Yu Yang Yi. yeah. He has lost uh, his last tiebreak he played against Ding Li Ren, before that winning the Armageddon game against Nikita Vitigo. Oof, what a roller coaster game yeah, that was. Then before that, winning his only uh, match in classical chess against Jan Nepomnici, as you can see, rounds one, two, through three, all were the tiebreaks. And even in round one, it took him six game, games to overplay uh, Exan Gaem Magami. That wasn't an easy tournament for Yu Yang Yi, and well, as you said, it's like two sides of a coin. So, so on one hand, you're warmed up, to pl uh, warmed up playing all those tie breaks. You're getting to, well, you're accustomed to such situation as you can. Well, sometimes you have to play for a win at any cost. Sometimes, yeah, it's like you have to play faster. While ah, the reminder about the there had to the have score. score. Yeah, so it's nine draws. Yeah, ten games in total, and only one was decided. That was a victory for Maxime Vachelagrov. Um I was even looking at my notes if I had made notes on the last game they played. They played in St. Louis in the Rapid and Blitz. In Rapid it was a draw, and in Blitz they both won a game each. Yeah, right. But th this one, these stats are for the classical games yes, only, indeed. and I have to praise our production crew uh, job that those three draws that we have here, they, have, uh, they are already included in the stats. So, so I was preparing, preparing those stats before the match. It was one victory for Maxime Vachilagrav and six draws. And now mm -hmm. you see it's You're getting right, updated, it's updated every day. <laughs> so thanks guys for keeping us updated. Uh, well, <clears throat> just to 
mentioned that it, it won't be as exciting as I was hoping for. Oh no, what happened? Oh, bishop e6, completely forgotten, I've completely forgotten about this move. So if this mm. move doesn't exist, then probably black would be in a bit of trouble because of this bishop c6 idea. But after bishop e6, and especially the fact that Maxim has taken on e6, because honestly I was thinking of something like that and how this could have been a bit problematic for black. Particularly the end game after bishop takes c4, bishop takes d7, takes, takes, it's never too much for white, but white is the side who controls the only open file as well as the square on e8. So after, say, rook d8, bishop c6, rook e7 is a serious threat, black goes king of eight, keeps it protected, but still that there would be some game. So white can play b3, try to advance the, uh, the king side, well, probably won't succeed, probably black will defend, but still feels like white has some sort of an initiative. While after bishop e6, bishop takes e6, I suspect black captures with the rook later on. Well, he can't take with the queen though, can he? Ah, that, that'll be a principal question, Anna. Look, queen e6, if this move is possible and white has to trade, that's just, just a dead draw and possibly it's black who is better. So I suspect white has to try queen takes on c7, where black captures on a2. Too. And yeah, something like this. Like for instance, in this line, rook d6, check, king goes there. Who knows what's that? Does this king survive? After rook e8, threatening queen e1, check. I mean, that, that, that's one messy position. Ah, well, rook e8, and then white goes queen e7, says, ha ha. Gotcha, <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Who gets mated? Yeah. So it, it's uh, white capturing the pawns, but it is the white king that may be mated. Those of you asking about Dingleren's game, we will of course focus on that game too, but there is no new move in that position, so yeah. there's nothing to add to what we have already said. So we can, ju just a flash of what, what's on the board currently in Dingleren against Rajabov, so well, the exchange on F3 has happened, and as I said, it's a very important moment for Rajabov to play or not to play D5, D4. And he's still debating this question. While on the other board, yes, rook takes e6 played. I don't see Maxim playing anything else but rook takes e6. And then perhaps black will have to take with the pawn, which might be nothing wrong with. But then, remember what we said, f4 and g3 all of a sudden is on the board. And then you put pressure on the e6 pawn. Yeah, so white had to, play, uh, had to pay some price for that because he has swapped... Well, one pair of rooks. Of course, in such situation, white would prefer as many pieces as possible to mm -hmm. apply extra pressure on this e6. So he had to trade one pair of rooks. But this position is still pretty much one-sided. White is trying, black is on defensive. So that's once again a good scenario for Maxime Michel Graf. So I'm really curious about uh, Yu Yang Yi's very next move. Queen Does takes he take, e6 yeah. is what he has to analyze because if that works, obviously that should be preferred to have takes e6. Yeah. So one more time, I'm, I'm checking something like that. Here, well, possibly b3 is not that stupid. So just like, yeah, in case of a check, yes, king has to go to d2, but it's not like it's in the real danger. While the pawn structure is, is much better for white, right? So d6 is weak. And also sometimes having the, uh, the king in the center helps in case of a queen's trade. So say rook e1 here, I clearly prefer white. So perhaps queen e6, even though it's like an active attempt, but perhaps not, not as good. So pawn takes, and then Maxim, well, will try for, for some time. Some pressure, a very similar picture in both games that white has a slight pressure. Um, in the Dingley Ren game, it's a material advantage, it's one pawn up, but doubled pawns. In terms of this game, Maxime has positional advantage for having more space and better pawn structure. So both players with the white pieces can try for a long time to test their opponents whether they can defend precisely, and only then it would be a draw if it's a draw. Yeah. So first we'll have to wait for Yu Yang Yi's decision. I believe he, yeah, he takes with the pawn still. A while there is a move from Teimur Rajab of the move is d5 d4. So that's 
kind of a more direct attempt to try to make a draw. More direct, but he was definitely double-checking everything. He spent 16 minutes on this decision. Honestly, I'm, I'm trying to understand what uh, Dean Lee Ren's reaction to this has to be. Because as we figured out, a capture on d4 doesn't seem to be that comfortable because the very next move is forced and then black castles long and he is threatening rook e8. So white is not on time to coordinate his pieces, it seems. What do we do here? It's like trading the bishops, but then how realistic white chances are in this position. King f1, trade here, rook d3, absolutely nothing, it seems. The moment you play king g2, of course, rook e2 happens. Oh, well, technically, he's, I mean, it's such an ugly way to defend those pawns, <laughs> but, but technically, he is still material up. And then king f1, you chase the And then king the f1, away. you chase the rook away, but say black plays g5. You go king f1, he returns the rook to e6. I mean, so many targets, so many targets for black rooks. I don't really believe white, white uh, has decent chances for a win. I mean, he has some. He has some. Rook to b1 immediately played? So that's, of course, is the different story, but it does allow black to play this bold move, d4, d3. And then, you know, now it, it all of a sudden becomes very, very concrete, because if white is not on time to prevent a rook's appearance on e2, he might be in a very bad shape. So it's going to depend on the tempo, yeah, whether the rook yeah, gets well, there in the, time. Then it's, a, then it's a really a serious question what, what white is supposed to do. But well, perhaps rook b5 is what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Bishop moves, you... Ah, well, and this is the moment you give a check. So d3, as much as it is attractive, it probably doesn't work. This check is important because if you get rook d5 immediately, which was initially my intention, now black plays rook d8, trades a pair of rooks and then still the other rook is ready to get to e2. So in such position, while white manages to defend f2 and still is a pawn up, it's clearly black who is trying. So that, that's something that you don't want to do. That is something that you don't want to do. But again, after d3, rook b1, bishop b6, this check is very important and it actually does seem to be in white's favor because uh, next move rook d5 and white uh, is about to win the d3 pawn. So yeah, question in the <laughs> chat if uh, instead of bishop b6, bishop d6 to, to prevent the check, but unfortunately for black that does not prevent rook d5. And yeah, the so pawn bishop falls. d6, yeah, it does stop the rook e5 check, but then in this case, yeah, you can't protect the the d3 pawn anyway. And two pawns up would be already a decisive advantage. Yeah. But the good point there, guys, and uh, keep coming up with your questions and thoughts both on Twitch and the YouTube monitor the chat. So let us know what do you think about the current situation in both matches. Do you think we will see a decisive result or even two decisive results? Today could be the last day at the World Cup if we have two victories. Yeah. Well, hard to imagine, to be honest, because both positions being so solid. Yeah, but you don't be this optimistic. Mm, no, no I'm <laughs> I, not. I would, if I had to make a bet, I think I would say one could be a decisive result and the other a draw. And I'm not picking which one is which. But uh, yeah, two decisive results. Unlikely. Let us know what do you think. We're going to see uh, if you guys agree with us here on Twitch or YouTube. And those of you who are watching on Twitch, remember that if you scroll down uh, below the window of the video, there is a panel where you can pick the game that you want to see, the current move, you can go back. So there is a game viewer on Twitch where you can check the current positions or even earlier moves if you want to analyze different positions. Yeah. This one, in fact, is the current position. And uh, while D3, as we said, looked attractive, but probably doesn't work. But I don't quite understand how it's, I mean, how it's different if black just castles long. And can white really allow himself not to take on c3, uh, on d4, c3 takes d4? I see someone saying that castle queenside is illegal. 
uh, I guess that's a joke, but the, if the rook can cross the b-file, it would be the king that cannot cross a check. So uh, here it's a possible move. This castle queenside is illegal in this position because the moment you castle queenside, the king crosses the square that is covered by yeah. white. Right? So, so you cannot... Castling rules. You cannot castle from check, through check, and, and into under check. And into check. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Obviously, if C8 is, uh, if <laughs> C8 is attacked, it's, it's like... You know what happened to me once? I was... That was yeah, of course, I, I'm not able to illustrate it, but basically it was a, what I thought very nicely played game, and then... Uh, the final, let's say, the final position that I'm giving a check on d1 to my opponent's king on e1, mm -hmm. and when he takes the rook, it's the checkmate. And what the guy does, he castles short. <laughs> you gave a check on d1 and he yes, castles short. Yes, he castles short and he's, you know, approaching the clock. And I was like panicking because, <laughs> I mean, I didn't know what to say. I thought I know the rules, and, but then the guy castle short. The point was, I mean, he, he, he was joking. I mean, he made the castle and then stopped the clock, so that was his way to resign. Okay. But <laughs> those few seconds, I was, I was like really panicking. Because <laughs> if this castle would be legal, I would just lose the game. Yeah. Wow. In Fisher Random, it did happen between Magnus Carlsen and Hikaru Nakamura that Magnus would have had a good position if Hikaru didn't have the option of castling. And when he castled and Magnus realized that it was po possible to castle, the, the position changed and Nakamura won that game. But uh, it just shows that in Fisher Random, it's still more difficult to detect when castling is possible or not Absolutely. since the, the pieces are uh, placed differently. Even for the top players in the world, it may be a possibility they, they don't realize you can still castle. Yeah, well, imagine. Now, that's a Fisher Random, and the king, in fact, has started on C1. Now, with rook on A1, the long castle would look like king stays on C1, yeah. rook jumps to D1. Yeah. Once again, we are talking Fisher Random. If rook is on h1, the short castle would look. Mm -hmm. King to g1, rook to f1. And then imagine you prepare a king's, uh, queen side attack with black. You sacrifice some material, you open files against the c1 king, and then bang, he castles short. So king basically flies over the entire board and yeah. is safe on the other wing. That's why, of course, it's, it's much more impactful if you blunder the castle like that in Fisher Random. Indeed. And uh, as for Magnus, he blundered once Hikaru's option of castling, and in another game, it would have been an improvement for him if he had castled. So him, he simply played rook to d1 to activate his rook. But, but if he, he had could realized. He overjumped the rook with the king as well. Yeah. yeah, if he had realized that he can prepare the castling because he needed to clear out a few more oh, yeah, pieces, yeah. but it, took, it would have taken him, I think, one move, and then he can castle, and you know, he reaches the same position with the rook, but his king is safe too, mm -hmm. then uh, also it would have been an improvement, and he didn't see it. So, world well, champion needs to brush up on his skills of castling. Uh, uh, castling, <laughs> definitely, the castling rules, at least in Fisher Random. Uh, right, uh, one more move from Yu Yangi. He does capture on e6 with the pawn, so no surprises here. And one more move by Rajabov. He does castle long. He knows how to do it. And since uh, his opponent doesn't really mind it, that means castle long is legal in this position. So that's the position we have. What is your feeling about these two positions? Let's start with Dingley and Rajabov. So pawn up for white, but those pawn ups, well, the one pawn up basically is a doubled pawn on the f-file. So it's not easy to create a pass pawn out of doubled pawns. Okay, so what Dingley Ren does is rook to b5. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to understand what's the, what's the big point of it. Say, Black doesn't feel the difference and just goes, well, maybe give the check first. I don't see the reason not to give this check. Then, I'm not even sure where the king is going. It could be d1, could be f1. And say, in both cases, Black plays bishop b6. Now, I believe threatening d4, d3. 
So feeling is like you've got to take it. Bishop takes, f2 is hanging. Rook f1, so white is a pawn up, but the pawn is doubled. The king is not very comfortable. Once again, whenever you play king c2, black is ready to go rook e2. So in this case, it does look still very, very safe for black. Not the most entertaining positions just yet, but we, we will see. See, perhaps uh, Dingley Ren does have an idea here. So what White would really love to achieve is to go c4 and be able to back it up with d2, d3. Because now one would think c3, uh, c4, c5 is a threat, so let's defend against c3. See, against c4, c5, I don't know where the c3 comes from. So c4, c5, and then white plays d3, of course. But no, d3 is possible, c5 does not win the bishop because of c6 or a6 chasing the rook away, and then black captures on c5. So yep. bishop b6, mm -hmm. instead of c4, what do you suggest for white? I'm really scared of this uh, d4, d3 option, so I suspect he has to take. Ah, oh, well, the other thing, if bishop b6 played immediately, then I might as well go rook e5, so that now chasing my queen from the e-file would require... Yeah, the uh, king is not vulnerable now in the open Yeah, file. yeah, it would require swapping a pair of rooks. This might be an idea, and, and therefore perhaps black has to start with, with check himself. So check first, see where the king is going, then play bishop b6. Well, yeah, that's what he does. Rook check on e8. And for a job of, you know, now that I'm understanding, uh, playing this kind of position pawn down is a familiar situation. I won't be able to reconstruct how the line is given, but he used to play uh, this line, which is Schliemann, Janis oh, Schliemann, Janis Gambit. Schliemann Gambit. Yes. Yeah. And there is one particular line, I don't remember how it's played, it's, I believe it was knight c3, but black actually does sacrifice a pawn and has a, well, a position pawn down with a white extra pawn build being doubled on a file, in fact, hmm. and black does good job of, of saving such games. It's true that he used to be fond of that variation, and that's not so popular at top-level chess. Uh, right, so, so it might as well be that he simply feels more than okay entering such position. Well, there have been one, precisely one more move in the game between Vashiel Graf and Yu Yan Gi. Rook. Do you want to switch there or discuss whether the king will go to d1 or no, f1? No, not much. No. no, this one is, for the time being, is much more, you know... Critical. Uh, much more critical, much more promising in terms of you know, some, some actions right here, right now. Because, yeah, oh well, since we switched the camera view, we might as well look at this one. Rook d2 and a7, a5. Well, so solid. Just so solid. That, that's the only weakness in the position. And, and, and how on earth do you attack that? I mean, with only one pair of rooks and queens being on the board, black might as well defend the e6 pawn with the king, if so will be the need. Like, go rook f6, go king f7, if you need it. So I really don't see Maxime succeeding in winning this one. And Ding Li Ren went for King D1. King D1, so now the situation is as it was before. The C5 bishop will need to find a spot. Once you move the bishop, you are threatening D takes C3. Yeah, so bishop B6 practically forces white to, to react. And... Yeah, f2 pawn is hanging as well, so in case, for instance, in case of bishop b2, black still would have d4, d3 move, but even a simple d takes, bishop takes, take on f2 with a tempo so that the rook is hanging, after rook f1 go to d4, just no problem for black whatsoever. 
So very, very likely, we will have two tie breaks tomorrow, Anna. That will, so? be, that will be, once again, if we are coming back to betting at this one, that, that is my current favorite. <laughs> I still hope for at least one decisive result. I am an optimist. Bishop b6, let's try to find an alternative for why that doesn't make a draw. Yeah, so bishop b6. I can lose play. the game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, b6. That, no, that's on a serious no, there has to be an alternative. That's my concern that, you, well, perhaps white can try to avoid simplifications in the draw, but in this case, to be might too much well, of a risk, you think? Yeah, might as well find himself in trouble. Honestly, I, I don't see what, like what he's supposed to do instead of a capture here. Well, there is rookie one, for instance, but then black seemingly wins the pawn back. Yeah, just takes on c3, trade the rooks, take on c3, take on f2. Well, perhaps that, that's what Ding Li Ren is opting for. Not precisely this position, but something like that where the resulting, the resulting, after all those simplifications, the resulting endgame will be just somewhat more pleasant. So he would give back the pawn but free his pieces? Yeah, like for instance here provoke h6, here provoke f6, well black, black is not forced but let's just imagine something like this happens. Goes g4, says well for potential bishops and game your pawns are on dark squares, maybe maybe I have a little chance. Not that I believe white has a decent chance here. And we have a move in the other game, I believe, between yeah. Maxim Vashtagrav and Yu Yang Yi. Uh, the next move played, yeah, after a5, a2, a4, played by Maxim. Magician no on Twitch is saying there. that it's an odd move, so Yevgeny, explain us why it's not an odd move. Which one? a2, uh, a4? a5, uh, a4, so a4 by white. Mm. I'm not sure if it's not. A, I mean, there is nothing <laughs> is it wrong. Odd or well, it's not odd? No, no, that, that, that's a fine move. I believe there is nothing wrong. Well, perhaps he was a bit worried about black expanding even further. Maybe, maybe that's the idea of playing a4 because black could have played b5 followed by a4, mm -hmm. getting a bit more space on the queen side. So therefore, a4 just to stop it. But the problem with such structures is that it's so tough for white to create any kind of past pawn or... I think both our Twitch and YouTube chat is being critical of Maxime's A4 move and does suggest that it could not be the best move of the engine. So it may even be dubious. So what then is the best move of the engine, I'm, I'm asking. Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. I mean... That's a very human move. Your opponent plays a5, wants to play either a4 or b5, a4. That's a very typical reaction. And unless black has something immediately going on, white will play b3, king b2 will be 100% safe. So, so if you guys in the chat, if you know what's wrong with a2, a4, please let us know so we'll... My feeling is that it's possible that it's nothing immediate or any anytime soon. Nothing wrong will happen to White because in that case, Maxim would realize that something can go wrong with this A4 move. It's possible that for the engine, it's a mistake because in 10, 20 moves, <laughs> that pawn will be a problem for White. Yeah, but I, I don't see how it's uh, being a problem. It, it could be, you know, it could be the other way. Uh, so after A4, you're more or less forced in next few moves, play b3, perhaps move the queen, and next what you do is probably play in c4, and that's the moment you lose the flexibility of a pawn chain, and it could be one of the factors uh, in, well, inbuilt in engine's evaluation. Hmm. So I'm not quite sure how those numbers work, I mean, for the engine. I mean, it's clear, plus three, its position is winning, it equals to three pawns up, but you know, to, to tell a subtle difference from 0 0.15 and 0 0.25, sometimes it would involve like some minor things which are, say, non-existent for a human eye. Yeah, I see now different opinions and many of you saying that nothing is wrong with A4. It probably, it depends on the engine you're using. If you're analyzing with engine, some of them could 
think that A4 is not good, others are okay with it. I see an alternative instead of A4 suggested is F4. But yeah, we don't see a real problem with A4. No, 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 I don't think there is a problem. I mean, the problem would be if, say, A4 and G5 and H3 would be already played, so that black has rook F4, attacking the queen and taking the pawn with the very next move. That's, I agree with you guys, in this case, it is a problematic, this is simply a bad move, right? But being as it is, well, just a move. Stop black's activity on the other side of the board. Rook F8 to F6 was played. Guarding this, perhaps planning to double and pin the e pawn, go e6, e5. Uh, really, it's so unlikely something, something bad can happen to either of those players. I mean, the position is just too dry, to be honest. And Ding Li Ren makes his decision as well after bishop b6. Mm, he didn't spend that much time looking for an alternative to cd4. He simply has played cd4. Oh. So cd4, bishop d4 is on the board. Oh no. Uh, oh no. Well, no, no, that's still fine. I mean, he still can keep his extra pawn there. Uh, uh, there he is, by the way, returning to the board after bishop d4. Yeah, but if that's what you do, you play rook f1. Yes, rook to f1. And as long as black doesn't have forcing way to win the pawn back and simplify, white might as well... No, it's awkward for white to develop the c1 bishop. And that's why I was always claiming white has to play bishop b2, trade the bishops, it's a draw. But now that I'm looking at it, if black doesn't have any threats himself, but might as well start pushing those pawns. Well, the rook on fifth rank is actually nicely placed. So f4, f5, other pawn to f3. So basically rearrange all four pawns of the king's side on light squares. If, say, uh, well, it's black to move. If black skips a few times, let's say. This is already the position when I'm starting to be optimistic. Because I'll play g4, I'll play h3 and then try to develop the bishop, possibly even not swapping with this bishop on d4, like going bishop a3. So, of course, it will not happen. Rajabal will not allow white just to, you know, to improve the position for free, but it kind of shows that white does have some idea and black has to react, has to react with his counterplay, has to be, has to be active. That's good news. So it's no very near a handshake. It's still a position where Team Rajabal will need to be accurate to get that half a point, which would lead to a tie break. But we are nowhere near a handshake. Yep. What about the other position? Any updates? No. Oh, no. Well, technically, yes. Rook f6, b2, b3. So moves are coming, but, but the position is not changing all that much. Back to the moment about A4, I think the conclusion by our dear chat, and thanks one more time for the comments, is that possibly the engine was simply critical of A4 because F4, the alternative, could have been a little bit better than A4, but those are just numbers for the engine. And uh, in a game between two human beings, luckily, it won't depend on that 0 0.10 or 0 0.20 that much. Yeah, absolutely. So, so it's in terms of... Uh in terms of the plans, yeah, White decided that he barely runs any chances on the queen side, and therefore he went a4, b3, and really I can foresee moving the queen away, going c4 to stabilize on the queen side, and then trying to pressure the e6 pawn, trying to push the king side pawns forward. B3. Well, one move that black has after B3, I mean, one of the options is queen f7. Not really threatening to take, but just unpinning the e pawn and carrying e6, e5, the very next move. There is no f4, and seemingly there is no way to stop e6, e5, to which black is very solid. Say f3, e5. 
If you trade the queens, I don't think there is anything for white. One way to try to use the fact that the pawns are actually doubled is to go queen b5, king b2, play b4, and hope black's going to take on b4. So untouble your pawns and have the, a, the possibility to create the a passed pawn. I say I'll make a couple of silly moves for black just to illustrate it. White goes b4, the a5 pawn is now hanging, so black has to take, and white recaptures with the c pawn. This might be the way to try to play this position for a win with white. Not necessarily successful. Black still has, of course, resources of his own. But there's a potential of creating an A-pass pawn. At least there yeah. is a potential. So both positions can still become interesting. Uh, yes, they are solid, but once again, it's good for the situation that these players are facing with the white pieces. And that is, this is the last classical game. You don't want to take a big risk because that would actually be quite uh, quite a silly move to make when it's your last game. So it's yeah, either absolutely. that they will make a draw and tomorrow we see tie breaks, or the player with the white pieces in both games is pushing and may succeed, but they can play risk free. Both Vashelagrav and Ding Liran have a position where it's either a draw or a win for white. And uh, these type of positions are ideal for the situation they are facing right now. Uh, right, so one more, one more move from Teimur Rajabov. After rook f1, the rook is lifted to the sixth rank, rook e6, where it has a lot of potential targets. Rook a6 to, well, attack the a2 pawn, rook h6 to force the h pawn to move. Makes perfect sense, as well as, at some point, to double on the d-file. That's also an option. I'm so. a little bit worried about the a2 pawn, because the h2 pawn, if it's a yeah, tag, you can push it. We but can a2 push, pawn, yeah. that's an isolated pawn, and it's not so easy to defend it. For, uh, well, we'll have to play a3, I believe. Yeah, but then your bishop, the bishop is doomed is to the defense of the pawn. The bishop is not particularly active. <laughs> you cannot move the bishop unless yeah. you trade it and then you lose your pawn. Yeah, but then, then you can try like f5. So the objective, the main objective is to get rid of this weakness on f2 by pushing it to, to, by moving it to f3. So you go f3, you go f5, and then the other rook is free, so you can play rook e1, some, some sort of rook e4. Once again, not very sharp, not very entertaining as of now. Yeah, it's more of a very slow positional grind, so it's like creating little problems if Rajabov will say next 30 moves, if he will make correct decisions, so there will be a draw, that's, that's very likely, but uh, yes, for Ding Liren, he has all the reasons to try being a pawn up. That's good news for us, that we have a game in both matches. Solid positions, but with potential. In terms of time management, uh, here Ding Liren is definitely not approaching any time soon. A time trouble situation. This is move 19. They need to play 21 more moves to get an additional half an hour. But both players still have plenty of time. In the other game, how's the time management? Oh, well, same. Roughly, hmm. well, not really equal. Well, Maxim Vashilograv, in fact, has 23 extra minutes. But then again, it's, it's not the position where every single move matters, right? It's like it's hard to imagine the situation where it will be a tough decision for, for Yu Yang Yi. And the fact that he's spending a lot of time, he's trying to eliminate the slightest danger of getting into trouble. He's not in trouble yet, hmm. right? I mean, so white is just a tiny bit more pleasant, I would say. So in terms of computer evaluation, it's like 0, 10, 0, 15, something. And yes, the theory of Yu Yang Yi arranging the pieces, <laughs> <laughs> you know, dividing them into ranks next to the score sheet, it stands true. Yeah, well, if we'll yeah, see if it from we a camera a view, that, that, the that, right that was a... angle. That was an observation by you guys in the chat, and yeah, it has nothing to do with the games, but it's interesting to see that he does care about the pieces that are 
already captured too, not only about the pieces that are on the board. So if you look at the white pieces that Yu Yangyi has captured, he places them in a perfect line and they are in order of value. Pawn, knight, bishop, rook. And if he, well, where is the queen though? Where did he, wait queen a second. Is, queen is on d7. Okay, and C4. yeah, yeah, but I mean, I was looking if he would place there the other queen, but no. no the other queen are, he doesn't touch. Those are the touch. spare queens yeah. there, because white queen belongs to the player with the white pieces. That's the extra queen yeah. he would need in case of promotion. Yeah, I know that, but I was wondering if he would place also the spare queen there, but probably he doesn't touch them because yeah, that's, no, that's I mean, always that, that's there. kind of yeah. impolite because if, if something happens and your opponent needs to promote the queen, yes. Yeah, so I imagine if he did that too. Anything, anything that he captures. That's already his. He is mm -hmm. arranging into yeah. ranks. Yeah. Uh, it's true. So not, it's not all the pieces next to the board, but the ones he has captured. They are in perfect line and ordered by value. And he was doing that also during the blitz games in the, the tie breaks. Yeah. So even with just a few seconds on the clock, he was still, I guess, subconsciously, because at this point, when you have 10 seconds on the clock, you cannot really be focusing on where you put your captured pieces. Well, an interesting decision taken by Yu Yang Yi. He goes d6, d5. He wasn't, uh, wasn't forced to do that, but he, well, he decides why not. I'll grab some space if I'm allowed to. So d6, d5. And now I'm actually wondering what type of a pawn structure he, he is going for. So d5. I suspect white has to control the e5 square just not to let black to build a strong center. And the question would be if c7, c5 will be played as well. Well, it does bring some sharpness into this game. Because even like a passive move like we need to, returning a little bit back, now does create a sort of a threat c3, c4, applying pressure on the d5. If, say, this happens, so white again, uh, once again, white is completely safe, not doing anything. Mm -hmm. But if he wants to, yes, c4, d4, c3, once again, trying to undermine this pawn. It's probably playing with, with fire, in fact. I, I don't really think it's, it's, it's a good operation for white, but at least the position can be somewhat disbalanced after, after d5. So maybe... That will bring some liveliness, you know, into in this otherwise pretty boring position. Sorry for Evgeny. that. Sorry for <laughs> no, that. This is becoming exciting, yeah. guys. This is becoming really exciting. Let's you've see. just showed how it can become exciting. Yeah, let's see. But, but again, the feeling is like the intentions of the players are such that well, let's not make it too exciting. Let let's not get overexcited. I would oh, yeah. love to see. This position becoming something of an imbalanced, complex position with chances for both sides. So let's uh, hope. Well, that's that's what actually it was yesterday in the game between <laughs> those two. I mean, with those knights, you need you need some minor pieces. I mean, that that's the feeling. Like whenever you have the knight around, there are always some you know some tricks, some checks, some double attacks. We are missing Being the knights on the board. Yeah. That's a pity. True. I still have hopes that this game can become interesting. Um, it's not symmetrical, so from that point of view, it could be worse if it was a French exchange <laughs> that I'm facing yeah. very often in my life. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And then, yes, maybe I'm telling this sad truth that, that this is not the most entertaining position, but for you guys at home, imagine like you're stripped off your engine and you have to play this position by yourself, and the structure is not symmetrical. How say how probable is the, you know, the fact that you make a draw against those players with white and with black? So I the position is fairly simplified, yeah. hmm. right? And looking at the engine, you you, you just spam in the chat. I mean, you, you, I, I I'd be doing this. I'd be writing in chat. That's a dead draw. Yes, yeah. show us the other game. That, that's what I'll be doing. But I was going to say, I, I think I, I, would I would be capable of losing this with any colors and not just against these two, because against these two I would lose Rook up too, uh, possibly. No, but no, maybe not Rook up. Seriously, no. no. <laughs> no Rook, Rook, up is, Rook up, I'm pretty confident with, with Rook up. <laughs> but yes, this position, if you forget that the evaluation of the engine must be around equal, it does have 
a lot of imbalances in terms of the bone structure, how the pieces are placed, opposite side costling. So it is not a boring position, and they both need to be precise. Yeah, that is. That, you know, I mean, when those top guys playing, and sometimes, like, they, they play a game like this, trade the pieces, like, create those threads, but the other guy doesn't fall for it. They make... Uh, those draws look so ridiculously easy that anyone thinks, oh, well, chess is such a simple game. You, know, mm -hmm. you bring rooks to the center, you trade them, you agree a draw and move 30. But no, when you try to play yourself against better opponents, you understand that any position can be lost. That's like you, you play it with white, you go for exchange French, you try to, well, you actually kind of follow all of your opponent's pieces to trade them, and you lose in the end. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. So... If you have spare time, try to play this position in a friendly blitz game. It's not easy with any of the colors if we need to come up with the best moves all by ourselves. But these are the best players in the world. And we hope to see a really exciting masterpiece where both players will do their best to improve the position. Will they find a chance to imbalance the position further? Will there be any hope for either white or black to get more than an equal position, we shall see. Maxim plays queen to e2. Queen to e2, yeah, because I believe he wants to stop e6, e5 from mm -hmm. happening. Will he be able to? Oh, that's another question. Because there is, for instance, a move like queen to d6, tucking h2, in some lines, I mean, it's not serious for now, but in some lines, queen a3 might be an important factor. And let's say after g2, g3, black might want to play e5 doesn't necessarily mean that black is immediately better, but for the time being, he has, he's the one who has the center. The f pawn is somewhat like, like a backward pawn on f2. There might be this moment where Maxime will have to identify that it's actually him who might get into trouble. Not yet, but yeah, that's like you play you play a few lousy moves, like you think, okay, nothing can happen here, so I'll just play b3, king b2, h3, g3, well, like any move, nothing will happen. And then you realize, oops, oh, that, that's, that's too late. My position is already worse. And then you try to play with the utmost precision, and if, you're, if the opposing player is a good player, you, it might be just, just, just too late. That very often happen with Jan Magnus, if you remember, I think he was the one back in, say, 2008, something like this, who brought this, this entire concept of it is a drawish position, but since I don't feel like I will lose it, I'll just play it. And he has won a lot of those symmetrical endgames, like the Berlin with rookie one lines, where you have precisely one single open file, seemingly massive simplifications. A lot of people would agree a draw. He would continue playing and not every game, but occasionally he would score against the very top in the world. Yeah, he's famous for his grinding skills and getting uh, points from positions that no one would even dare to continue or would think that yeah. why go on with this game if it's a draw. But he squeezes water out of stone so many times and that influenced also how the rest of the top players approach these yeah, positions. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, sometimes as well, I've heard of, uh, yeah, from, from the top players, like in the conversation, we, we would discuss some opening line, and then I'm, then I'm asking, like, what's wrong with this particular line? Because the, the final position seems to be fine. Mm -hmm. And the answer would be, yes, it is fine, but the other guy had played forever. And I don't want to defend, even though the position is defendable, I don't want to defend for a long time. So now the ideal scenario of, let's say, ideal analysis in the opening, that the final position is absolutely transparently clear how to make a draw. Right? So they don't want to accept slightly more passive position where you have to defend. So that really changed the approach, I believe. It did, and uh, that's why they try to find variations where they can force the simplification and not have a slightly worse but forever going battle. Forever going battle is what we are facing in both uh, matches, I believe. So that's good news for, for us, the spectators, you guys at home. We hope that you are happy with today's games. Yes, we could also wish for a more aggressive attacking chess position, 
But take into account the situation. Today is the last classical game, and they are not here to make a fool of themselves. So it would sure. be really, it would be really too much of a bravery if they go for something extremely sharp, where it's either all in and you win, or all in and you lose. So no one would do that in this situation. A hundred and ten thousand dollars is the first place. 80,000 for the second and for the third place the difference between the two prices is $10,000 but also a potential white card for the candidates. For the candidates which well, I believe was much more than than this difference right. Uh, Bishop B2 is not very inspiring move in the game between Dean Livran and Rojabov. Uh, supposedly black just takes on B2 Rook takes b2, I believe, will be played. Oh, wait a sec. It could be, now that I'm thinking, but can try to improve on this line by going rook a6. Because now there is no a3. In this case, black takes and takes. Mm -hmm. So bishop d4, rook d4. Now a2 pawn is hanging, so he's got to play rook b2 back. Then rook goes to a4. Who is better at all? Probably nobody. Probably nobody. Oh, well, white goes rook e1, tries to get to e7. Uh, we we'll shall see. Black take the pawn on a2, but the other rook will be activated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be a possible scenario. I'm still hoping it won't be a rook end game, but how do you not go for a rook end game? Oh, well, yeah, I don't think black is in a position to try to avoid simplifications. I mean, because after all, he is pawned down. And at first I was looking at this, like trade, kill rook d3, attack this one, but then white has rook b3, which might still be a draw, but at least, you know, white keeps his extra pawn in this very case. But the more I look at it, the more I understand. Tiebreak tomorrow for the final, tiebreak tomorrow for the third place. Evgeny, don't be this optimistic about our chances of seeing a decisive result today. Yeah, I'm wondering at the current stage of both positions. I would actually prefer this, the one that I have on my analysis board, Maxime Bouchier Graf and Yu Yang Gi. The chances for the result, in my opinion, are higher there because of queens are still on the board. Mm -hmm. And yes, the material is equal, but with queens on the board, with already not such a symmetrical situation in the center, I would believe that there will be something going on. Uh, while in Dingli and Rajabov after bishop b2, you know, if you are if you are a classy player, whom Timur Rajabov, of course, is you should be able to make a draw, no problem. What is your prediction, guys, here on Twitch and YouTube? Do you think that uh, the game between Dingren and Timur Rajabo will peter out soon to a draw? And we may then have the other game being more exciting, as Yevgeny pointed out. There are queens on the board, imbalanced in terms of the structure. Also imbalanced in the structure here in the Dingliren game, an extra pawn for Dingliren, but his pawn structure is really weak. The A2 and D2 pawns are isolated, and his extra pawn is a doubled pawn on the F file. So not an easy game to convert for Dingliren. Uh, we shall see which game will go on longer. What is your prediction? Let us know on Twitch and YouTube what do you think will happen in the two games and for how long we will see the players continuing today. Who will try? Yeah, well, that, that's a very nice way to put it. Like, which game is going to go longer? Well, that's okay. also a question, right? <laughs> we don't know the answer and I would love to see the players trying. Of course, I think they will try as long as they see that they can try with a free hand, so there's no risk, then they yeah. will try. But as soon as they may sense that the tables can turn, they will, they will not want to take that additional risk. Yeah, you don't want to gamble in such situation where a loss is just like you lose the match immediately, right? So yeah. again, if, if you reach the point where there are two ways and one of them is more or less a forced draw and the other one would involve you taking an unnecessary risk, then, then you go, well, you play move one, you, know, you, you go for a draw. 
at least uh, that uh, seems to be the case with our place. I mean, there are people who are ready to take gamble in the chess world. Yeah, well, it's not that easy to come up with an example there. Or thinking there are people who are... Who will put everything on the line in one game? Well, we have cases for quite the opposite. For instance, Magnus Carlsen not wanting to put everything on the line in that final game against Sergei Karyakin. And, and against Fabiano Caruana as well. The same against Fabiano Caruana in the last two games, even after having a better position in the final game. But he had it very clear. It was just so clear that all he wanted is to get to move 30, make a draw, call it a day, go for the tie breaks, because on move 30, he's better, and all he wanted was to offer a draw and go for the tie break. So in terms of mentality, he was very sure of what he was doing, and he proved he proved he that the yeah, system well, works for him. This 3 no on the tie break, that was, that was very, very impressive. Yes. Really so, impressive, So yeah. perhaps he rightly thought that he's a massive favorite on a tie break, right? And he rightly thought that for long, long time. For years, Magnus Carlsen has never, ever lost a tie break until this summer against Dingliran. So Dingliran, for many of uh, you guys too, I've seen in the chat mentioning Dingliran could be the next challenger of Magnus Carlsen. I agree that he's one of the main candidates. Also, let's not forget Fabiano wanting to get another chance. But Magnus uh, will, I think at some point of his life, will need to face Dingliran. That's my yeah, that's, feeling. That's the feeling, yeah, you are absolutely right on this one. And this particular guy is not necessarily the guy Magnus Carlsen wants to make a draw from a better position to go to a tiebreak. <laughs> he already has not a good memory about yeah. playing a tiebreak against Ding Liren. What's sure is that both Ding Liren and Teimur Rajabov are in the candidates tournament for next year and the winner of the candidates tournament will be the challenger of Magnus Carlsen. Ding Liren was the first Chinese grandmaster to make it to the candidate uh, in the previous edition and now he repeats this feat. He's also the first Chinese player to cross 2800, first player ever in history to qualify twice to the uh, Final? World Cup Finals. Yep. He lost two years ago in Slevona Ronyan after four draws he lost in the tie breaks. This time there aren't that many draws but it's a tie. We shall see whether there will be tie breaks. Mm, yes yeah, so and no move, well since we are still talking about Ding Liren, no move in Ding Liren's position. Well a reminder of uh, Ding Liren's performance in the World Cup this year. So a one, uh, to no victory, that's the only perfect victory by Ding Liren in round one against Sean Press. Then, and well, Sean Press was with, was with us in the chat a few days ago. Yeah, well then a victory against a game of Session on a tie break that perhaps was uh, the match where we can say Ding Liren was in trouble at some point. He, he was losing in game one with White. It wasn't like the position wasn't lost until the moment he made a bad move. So it was like an accidental blunder, which Movsisian could have taken advantage of. Hmm. And then it would be a well, absolutely different story. But the tie break was won quite convincingly. And then there were two tie breaks against, well, first against Firuja, second against Alexeyenko, both won 2 nil by uh, Ding Liren. Then there was this match against Alexander Grishuk. A very nice victory in the English opening with the white pieces for Ding Liren. And then uh, the semi-final against Yu Yangi. Two solid draws and then once again a victory in the tiebreak. This impressive game when he was the one to be surprised in the opening but found all the best moves of the engine. Do we have any new moves uh, in any of the games? Well, not yet in Dingley Ren's move against uh, Dingley Ren's game against Rajabov. And there are some moves. There is something going on in Vashia's game against Yu Yangi. So after Queen E2, let me find it here. Yeah, Queen E2, Rook to F5 was played. King B2, Queen to D6, attacking H2 pawn, H2, H4. So with rook b on f5 guarding h5 square, I'm actually debating the move king to f7 to guard the e6 pawn, to free the queen, to look at some moves like queen e5 or queen f4, and you know, slowly but surely, I'm getting the impression that it's actually black who is more comfortable. 
And then will we see Yu Yang trying to play for a win and not wanting a draw? Mm, well, we might because s same situation. So if free hand. Free hand, yeah. Basically, not risking much. I mean, if say if Queen E5 happens, we have a rook end game, which is slightly better for Black. Why not to try? I mean, you can't really lose a slightly better end game. Oh, well, well, some people can. I can. <laughs> I could. <laughs> Uh, right, Even so. at top level, it's just there were yeah, a of few course. examples of like which which game was that? It was a rook end game. Was it four versus three? I will not be able to recall it. But it's when White is trying and trying and trying and then hangs some. Or it was uh, rook versus minor piece. Oh, I now I will. I'm sorry, I will not be able to recall the exact story. But when you are grinding and grinding and grinding and then you hang a piece. Yeah, well, this, this can happen, of course, but it, yeah, it's like... Yeah, it doesn't it, happen often. It's not the reason for you not to try, right? I mean, if, if you're aware of such examples that it, you can blunder a piece, well, sometimes happens. Not very likely with our players, but... All right, so another moment where the games are slowed down. Yu Yang Yi thinking of the move 24, while for a job of is... It's still move, his move 20 to be played, down to 35 minutes, Timur Rajabov. It's a bit of a time pressure, uh, since oh. they get more time from move 41 on, but uh, yes, since the position is now very complex, it isn't that difficult to make moves f somewhat faster than what he has done in the first 20 moves. Yeah, particularly, I, I believe it's no choice between going or not going for the rook endgame involved. Yeah, you do trade the bishops, you do want bishops off the board and then play the rook endgame. So he's uh, looking for what, say, what particular endgame I want. Do I want to take on b2 and then simply say, well, one of the ways to play would be, I'll take, put the rook here and just say, it's good enough. I don't care, I'm pawned down. I'm just like pressing on d2 and not allowing white to activate his pieces. This could be one thing. The other thing was this rook a6 and trying to win the a2 pawn back and maybe complicating matters a little bit. So you take on a6, by that time white say activates the rook, gets it to e7. It could be still something sharp and therefore, of course, Rujabo wants to wants to double check in this very position. We're going to let him double check the variations and we'll go for a short break while Timur Jabov makes a decision about the Rook and games that Yevgeny explained. We will also need to see whether Yu Yang Yi, now that he is comfortable enough, will he even try to get more than an equal position against Maxim Vershelagrav? That's going to be the story of the day. Will we see tie breaks tomorrow or will there be a result or two today? We're going to go for a few minute break and then we are back with these two games.
Welcome back, everyone. Today is the final classical game between Yu Yang Yi and Maxim Vashlagraf for the third place, ending Liren and Tamir Rajabov for the first place. We have a couple of new moves, so let's just catch up with the players real quick. A rook and the bishop has been traded in the game between Ding Liren and Tamir Rajabov. Oh, we have one game on them. What? Well, technically two. Uh, but <laughs> since it's a move 31 in the game between Ding Liren and Tamir Rajabov, they just agreed a draw. Oh, no. They just agreed a draw. We can catch up with the moves, uh, there was well, like a proper sequence found by both players because Rajabov did win the pawn back on a2 and he was already not clear who is better. Ding Liren created some threats and Rajabov was more or less forced to trade one pair of rooks. It's a draw, the final game, final game of the final and it's a tiebreak tomorrow. So four classical games didn't give advantage to any of the players. Ding Li ran one game two, but then Rajabov immediately bounced back yesterday in game three. And today, not that many chances there were. The good news about this, uh I, as a chess fan, of course, am disappointed to not see more fight in this game. But the good news, the good side of this story is that tomorrow they will play tie breaks. Absolutely. Which is two rapid games starting with 25 minutes plus 10 seconds. And if that's a, t a tie after the two games, we keep cutting down the time control. A 10 minute rapid game and after which there is Blitz. two additional blitz games and an Armageddon if the score is still a tie. I'm... Um, I was hoping for a somewhat longer game for today, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, well, honestly, it was, it was quite, a, quite a quick one, but we can't deny it. It was quite logical, I mean, what players were doing. So Rook A4, and I believe we took a look at this, so that mm -hmm. this way Black wins the pawn back. Rook to E1, and then if you trade over everything over here on A2, then white goes rook E7. It's actually white who has decent chances because he'll start collecting those kingside pawns. Therefore, king E7, then by the same token, if white waits time, black takes on A2. So no activity for white, and black is getting the past A pawn. Therefore, rook B8 and takes here, and rook E8. Once again, white is ready to start attacking the king's side pawn with the rooks. And therefore, a check here, king E2, swap one pair of rooks. And Very logical. This, is where you, this is where you feel that, yeah, okay, this game is no longer that exciting. And it was check, forced, unfortunately, yeah. for white in this case. He couldn't keep the two rooks on the board. And then, yeah, then he, he thought, well... This game doesn't deserve to be played any longer, attacked both pawns, and, and they've agreed to draw right here. White always has the repetition, black has to defend the, the pawn that white is attacking. Therefore, a draw was agreed, so those two will be back to have a tiebreak tomorrow. Let's find out what happens in the third place playoff. So once again, game four, Maxim Vashielograf with the white pieces. At some point, I've started to explain why I like Black's position, but I was told that an engine doesn't actually confirm mm. what Yu Yang Yi is doing, particularly questioning his move D5. Really? Over here, yeah. So D5, according to an engine, is not the most accurate. It, it would play Queen F7 and play just keep the, keep the position as is, mm. not even ca caring to play E5. Uh, um, so the current situation. Before we continue, mm -hmm. sorry, I, mean, oh, yeah. I need to interrupt because we will talk to Ding Liren and Tamir Rajabov about Absolutely. their game today, and then we come back to this one. Sorry, they just told me really suddenly. So the fourth game of the final match, uh, Din Lejeune against Timur Rajabov has finished in a draw. So Din, you've played with the white pieces. How can you estimate your position after the opening and this game in, in, in general? Uh, he played bishop g2 that I hadn't prepared. Uh, although he's slightly worse, but I think we played a correct game and none of us made any mistakes. So the draw is a very normal result. And what's your idea about this game? And so the, the end game with uh, rooks, was it equal? Yeah, but it's like, you know, I mean, uh, at this point already it's kind of hard to know, to calculate anything. So at some point you're questioning given your decisions and so on, and especially in the crucial game. But um, okay, generally, I mean, it seems that black can probably hold uh, with many ways there. 
but um, you know you make one mistake and then it becomes tricky so uh, I was kind of worried not to make a mistake simply because I mean the position looks very simple but in fact okay probably I can go even rook d3 instead of rook a6 and stuff but okay I mean like take on b2 and rook d3 and stuff should be drawish as well but um, I mean Okay, it's slight plus for white, it's easier to play and uh, I was just thinking if I have to allow this, you know, uh, rook penetration to e8 and stuff or maybe rook e4 instead of this and check to d4, stuff like that, but uh, after calculating the lines it seemed that uh, it's just equal, so yeah, I just went for it, that's why I took so much time there, otherwise I would just play bishop b2 and rook d3, which seems to be very close to a draw as well, but um, okay, I saw that maybe it can become tricky at some point if White keeps the rook on b2, then tries to transfer the king from f1, g2, h3. You know the fantasies of uh, a 25th day of playing, but uh, in general should be draw as well. But okay, I mean I didn't want to complicate it for myself, so try to to uh, do it in a convincing way. And generally, uh, yeah, out of the opening, I mean it's uh, it's generally no online for us. But um, I mean there are some tricks and some ideas, but uh, yeah, certainly it's a, it's a huge line. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so now you're going to play a playoff tomorrow, so what do you expect from this match? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I got used to play playoff, so <laughs> yeah, I'll prepare better with black pieces tomorrow. <laughs> and you? Yeah, say more or less, I mean it's like uh, already I don't know which kind of uh, games are suitable for us. But uh, maybe bullets. We would play like 100 games Fisher to decide random. Fisher random or something. <laughs> yeah. Ten games maybe would be fine and fun as well. But um, yeah, I mean it's it's normal thing. So it's a uh, normal thing, especially here. Mm -hmm. So uh, just generally also we'll try to uh, rest and uh, play the match tomorrow. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much and good luck to you. Thank you. Mm. Thanks. Have a handshake in the other game as well as we switch back from the interview. That has been move 30 and the draw offer by uh, Yu Yang Yi after Yang King F7. Uh, right, so it simplified rather quickly and a draw was agreed as soon as it was allowed by the rules. And interestingly, it wasn't, uh, you see, I mean, it wasn't such a harmless game because players keep analyzing players keep discussing it over the board. So, so there were certainly some underwater stones over there. Right, so it wasn't, it wasn't all that clear. Yeah, and I think that's something that's uh, unfair to the players. Oftentimes when they make a draw, uh, we may see it as, oh, a boring draw, or oh, it was not so exciting. But oftentimes, as you said, like in this game, there were a couple of details that the players had to see. And many times the most beautiful and most interesting variations are not played on the board because you need to calculate it and then avoid it. Absolutely. And, you know, well, bringing back this mm, brilliant surprise for the best game. So we were having, a, you know, a discussion with Leoncio Garcia, who does commentary in Spanish, that we have to be very clear about the terms because the best game usually doesn't look that spectacular because players do not make obvious mistakes mm -hmm. allowing spectacular tactics. So True. the brilliant game is often not very well played by one of the sides, mm -hmm. while the best game... So I'm not necessarily claiming that this is the best game of a tournament, but that supposedly is a game of a very high quality when one guy applies the pressure, the other guy reacts in a precise manner to nullify all the, all the attacking ideas, all the ideas to play for win, and therefore they agree a draw. Can we have our analysis board back and copy their moves? Because they are actually showing on the board for once. The players are showing on the board their thoughts. Usually they just uh, talk about it and play blindfold chess. Yeah, right. I, I believe the discussion is... Uh, well, about this position after rook f5, king b2, queen d6, and Maxime was stating something about playing g3 and not h4, as far as I got it. The g3 opting for f2, f4. Something like that was the, was the discussion. But I'm actually not sure if they have the right position over there. <laughs> Because <laughs> at some point it would seem, ah, well, oh, look, uh, now, now this is yeah. the other one. Queen takes uh, queen E6. Takes E6 this is queen takes E6. The one that we were discussing. We yeah. we queen it. takes on C7. Queen takes over there. Rook D6. 
I know, no, 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 they are too quick, you know, they are too brilliant. <laughs> so queen c7, queen a2, and then Maxime says I would have gone b4. Hmm. B4. B4, so B4 capturing on D6. Is arguably stronger than B3. Hmm. Yeah, remember I was, I was saying that even a B3 and then after check go to D2, but B4 is more precise in a way that it doesn't allow black queen to go back, right? So D6 pawn is weak. Yeah, so this is much better for white, of course. And then they are back to the position with rook. Which one is it? But this is great. They are actually showing the lines. Oftentimes they yeah, discuss yeah. it, but without moving the pieces. He won b6, and Maxime says, maybe I shouldn't have, shouldn't have played bishop d5, but go for rook e3. Uh, rook goes there, rook g3. Yeah, that's the discussion. Yeah. Actually, they are talking some very, very sharp lines here. I would love to go back to the close-up so that we can see the board. Um, but Some this may be the end of the post-mortem. Very, very sharp lines. Yeah, but that, that, that will be it. So we will wait for the players' explanation on, on this last game of the third place playoff. And guess what? Who was right? Yeah, there will be two tiebreaks tomorrow. You were right. I'm sorry for spoilers, but yeah, it was meant to be. It seems it was meant to be. We will wait for the players to give us an interview. So don't go anywhere because they should be ready in a few minutes for an interview. And as Yevgeny said, two draws. But that means that we'll be back tomorrow for short, shorter time control. The more shorter games. the time control, usually the more mistakes and the more exciting the games can become. Uh, yeah, and it's now since, well, both matches ended in, well, four draws in in third place playoff, what do you think? It's like they're both kind of happy with the tiebreak. For the finals, I believe Ding Li Ren was not intending to go to the tiebreak when he won game two. But after suffering a blow yesterday, well, perhaps he thought it's okay. Make a draw, well, play the rapid playoffs after all. He has won all the, all the, all the tiebreaks, as well as Rajabov so far. That's why they're in the final. Yeah, they have won every single tiebreak. Uh, yesterday, for sure, was uh, a heartbreaking moment for Dinger, and I don't think he actually had in mind that he would get into trouble, especially in the Marshall that's supposed to be so well analyzed, and he has it also so well analyzed that he he said he was out prepared and he got into a very difficult end game where he still didn't know where he made a mistake. Yeah. That was his evaluation after the game. Yeah, that was that was a particularly spectacular thing uh, Rajabov has prepared that. Remember, we had him in the studio, yep. and he said c5 is the move that would actually make a draw for black. But if we are throwing back to the moment we've seen it on the board during the commentary, I said, I'm playing bishop f8, not spending a single moment. So perhaps, yeah, I didn't delve deep enough in the position. But point being that it really slips away from you. The, mo the critical moment where you actually have the best move to play. And after bishop f8, knight c5, it was already somewhat problematic. Rajabov clearly shown uh, how, I mean, how tough it was for black. Yeah, black later on missed few chances for a better defense, but that was very well played game by Rajabov. It was a brilliant game. And we shall see what tomorrow will bring between these two players. A funny suggestion by Rajabov that they could play in bullet chess or uh, Fisher random. Games, yeah. 100 <laughs> games play off in bullet chess, which means one minute each, no increment. Yes, but what's going to happen one more time tomorrow? Two games first with the normal rapid time control, that is 25 minutes plus 10 second increment. If that's a tie, we're going to have a shorter rapid game, a pair of shorter rapid games with 10 minutes plus 10 seconds, and then cutting down to blitz in case this is still a tie. And the final stage is the so-called Armageddon, sudden death. That's five minutes for white, four minutes for black. But in case of a draw, black wins the game. So that would be black being declared the winner of the match. Yeah, and I remember still those, well, in a way, ironic matches where all the games would finish in a draw and then just the lucky guy who had black in the final Megadon game would win the match. So we still have, theoretically, we still have this possibility in the third place playoff that you know, all the games will be drawn, but that, of course, is very, very unlikely with shorter time controls. It's going to be very exciting to see the tie breaks. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, 
and who will I prepare who Ding Liren and Demar Javov they both got into trouble with the black pieces so yeah. as Ding said he has to brush up on his opening variations with the black pieces not to do the same in the rapid Absolutely. And, you know, we keep, or rather I keep talking about how narrow Maxime's repertoire is with black, but mm -hmm. now that I'm thinking of Ding Li Ren, he knows his martial very well, but that's apparently the only line he's playing against, uh, against the Rui Lopez, the martial set. True. So it makes it easy to prepare against him, in a way. And Rojabov and the team behind him, they are clearly intent to not to you know not to try to play the position from move eight which you have after one of the D3 versions mm -hmm. of the Rilopis, but to test Ding in specific lines of the Marshall. It's like once again a very broad perimeter because White has well quite a few, you know, a handful of options to get for this or though to go for this or that particular endgame. It's like nobody wants to grab a pawn in the Marshall and get checkmated by move thirty, which was you know, quite, quite often <laughs> was the case some back 15, 15 yeah. years back. Yeah, so now what White does, to, wants to stay safe and try to test black a little bit. And then, well, it's like, so far it's been 75% of school, right? So one of the two attempts went successful. Yeah, so and that's... it could be another test tomorrow. But for now, we're going to have an interview with the two players for the third place, Maxim Vershagrov and Yu Yang Yi. So we are on air with Maxim Vashilagraf and Yu Yan Yi. So the fourth game also finished in a draw. It was the Petrov defense once again. So what can you say about this game? Yeah, it was very close to be seriously better. Uh, for instance, um, I, c I was quite happy with my idea of bishop d5, queen c4. It sort of forces this uh, point structure, with, which is fundamentally fundamentally. Uh, better for white, but the problem was in the game I couldn't solve uh, immediate problems. For instance, uh, when I had to order rookie five, for instance, it's clear I'm not better anymore. But uh, if I manage to to get f four in a timely f fashion with this rook on f five, it's suddenly extremely unpleasant for black. So um, yeah, I felt I was very close to being seriously better, but I never could. Uh, uh, quite manage. Mm -hmm. And do you agree with this assessment? That you, were, that you could be worse in this position? Yes, uh, maybe it's uh, middle game. White has some moment uh, have a chance, I think. But uh, I don't know how to play White. Yeah. I think uh, it's okay today. Uh -huh. How do you estimate your chances in the playoff? Yeah, I don't really care anymore. Uh, I mean, of course I care. But uh, today is, uh, I mean, tomorrow is the last day, and uh, that will be very welcome. <laughs> and what about you? Uh, yeah, so tomorrow, last day, yeah. Uh, I hope tomorrow I'll play a good game. Uh, maybe tomorrow, sometimes, um, I win, sometimes uh, Maxim will win <laughs> rapid. I think uh, the parents, yeah, tomorrow, yes. Thank you very much and good luck to you. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I think it's normal that the players are so keen on returning home. They have spent almost a month here in Hunting Mass 6. This is the longest chess tournament for most of these players, if not all of them, Absolutely. basically. Yeah. Nowadays, yeah, even the World Championship match was somewhat shorter than what they play here in Hunting Mass 6. Uh, well, and during those interviews, there was a lot of you know, very good points brought by the players that I would clearly stand by, but... I cannot agree more that, well, tomorrow is the last day of this tournament. That's what makes you happy. 
<laughs> Yevgeny, are you happy about it? For you too, it has been a record time yes. spent away from home and in Siberia. Yeah, that was a that was a fun tournament to cast, and I believe tomorrow's day will be particularly exciting. Yeah, but yes, I do feel a bit exhausted. So if it would go for one more week, I'm not sure if I'll be able to make it. So once again, the reminder of the score in the classical games of the final and the third place playoff. Four draws for Maxim Bashelograf and Yu Yangi and the exchange of victories, but still a tied match for Ding Li Ren and Teimur Abzabov. Yeah, out of the draws between Yu Yangi and Maxim Vashagrav, yesterday's game where Yu Yangi had the white pieces, in that game it does feel like Yu Yangi missed a big chance. As Maxim said in the interview, if the rook trade was uh, prevented on the back rank, he probably was even a lost position, that was his evaluation. He said he had no idea what he would have done in that moment. Uh, yeah, right. So, well, despite the fact that indeed this third place playoff looked like a much quieter match compared to the final, but there being a lot of tension as well. And sometimes, you know, going f for those two players, going to a tiebreak, and then, then you would expect, ah, well, those guys, they'll make draw after draw after draw. But no, very often those matches, they are resolved in the f very first portion of a rapid playoff. As, by, by the way, was the case in the previous World Cup for the final between Dean Giren and Aronian, because there was very solid four draws in the classics. And then Aronian more or less easily won 2-0. Yeah, that will rapids. be for something to think about for Dean Giren. Well, obviously, two years have passed, so I don't think he feels like, oh, two years, two years ago I had to play tiebreaks in the finals and I lost both rapid games. But uh, you don't forget your past, do you? He has improved his chest a lot, so he, he said that now he is a favorite here in that match. He wasn't a favorite. Uh, but he will definitely remember yesterday's game, which was painful that he lost his advantage in the match. Uh, right. So that I, I'm not even sure, I mean, whom would I give the psychological advantage in those tie breaks? If this last game, the kind of the bounce back would happen today, then clearly Oof. the player who kind of got into danger of il being eliminated in the last game, but then comes back, then of course he has an advantage going to the last game. So for Ding Liren, in a way, it's good that he lost yesterday, not yeah. today. Right. I agree with you. I agree with you. To recover from one day to the other, when you know that that half a point would have given you the title, it would be way more difficult. But we shall see what happens tomorrow how the players will come to tomorrow's games. Tomorrow we will know who wins the 2019 FIDE World Cup and who will get the third place that may be a potential wildcard for the candidates tournament. Thank you so much for being here both on Twitch and YouTube and we hope to see you guys tomorrow. Same time, same place for the last, very last broadcast.